All right, one more final, uh, hopefully fairly brief little lecture about um, distributions, about probability distributions. That's what everything's been leading up to, all this probability business for the last few days. It's all leading up to distributions and how we use those. We need to understand a little bit about continuous probability distributions because those are what we use for our theoretical models more often than not. So continuous distributions, come here you, um, <laughs> let's look at some big data. Uh, let's just kind of show you how continuous distributions are made. You can imagine that you sampled a bunch of people and asked them how many years they'd been at their job. And there were 80,000 people. <laughs> There's like 100,000 people in this. Uh, let's say you only have five pins. You only look at whether they've been at their job zero to 10 years, 10 to 20 years, 20 to 30, etc. So it's a, a histogram. Well, then you can connect the tops of those histograms and make what we might mathematically call a curve, even though it's really a bunch of straight lines and angles in standard parlance. What if we break it up into 10 bins instead of only five bins? So now you're going in bins that are five years at the, at the job each. Well, now we have a curve that starts to bend a little bit more. What if we went with 20 bins? Now we're starting to see the shape of this curve develop much more seriously here. And it's still kind of pointy and angly, but it's getting more smooth. What if we broke it into 30 bins? So 30 bins, I don't even know. We're looking at like a certain number of months at your job for, for each bar. We're grouping people by, you know, two or three months at their job, something like that. So then the curve looks like that. It's still kind of blocky. 50 bins. It's even less blocky and more smooth. 100 bins. So now we're looking at, uh, you know, small fractions of a year. In, in how we group the employees here and how they report their data. So 100 bins, this is a much smoother distribution here. 500 bins, look how teeny those little lines are. This is quite smooth. This is a very smooth distribution. So imagine that you could have an infinite number of bins. Imagine that you could have infinitely thin bars. Then you would have continuous distributions. And as you imagine, they don't exist. They exist theoretically. So a continuous distribution has infinite divisions between any two points. I mean, this is the, the logical end point of truly continuous numerical data is the idea that you could divide, divide perfectly continuously, infinitely, all the space between all the points. And so you could have these bars that are infinitely thin and the curve across the top of them would be perfectly smooth. It would be a true curve. Uh, this only makes sense with continuous variables most of the time. Um, and we use these concepts of density density distribution, probability distribution function. The density is the height of the curve at any one time. So the height of one of those tiny, tiny, super thin bars, its height is density. And that density is essentially kind of like a probability. And so we group all of these densities together across this curve into probability functions, probability distribution functions, density distributions. There's lots of names for them. These are all pretty much the same thing. But these are theoretical distributions, and they don't exist in real life. They only exist in our minds and in equations. They're useful, however, for comparisons. So I think I've said it before, but let me say it again. A perfect theoretical model of something that doesn't exist in real life can be very useful. And my great example for seat of my pants, you know, real life example of this is if you have the perfect the model in your mind of the perfect man or the perfect woman that you would like to be with for the rest of your life the perfect boyfriend girlfriend the perfect husband wife it's not useless to have that model in your mind because then you can compare everybody you meet to that model as long as you're realistic and realize that not everybody well nobody's going to perfectly live up to that you can use that perfect model as to gauge people. You can say, well, so-and-so is uh, pretty similar in the loving pets department, but not so similar in the not having a criminal record department. And this new person, well, they didn't gaze into my eyes longingly as much, but they were good with walks on the beach. So you can use these, these models, a theoretical perfection, to compare against the real world, and you can actually use that to help you make decisions. And that's what we use. We use these, even though they don't exist in real life, these perfect theoretical continuous distributions that are described by a mathematical distribution, not by real data. And then we fit them to our real data and we see how well things fit. Now a note about these density functions, continuous distributions, the probability of any specific value is zero. Because if you say, well, but a 10 is a number, not really. 10 is 10.0000000000, like infinite zeros. It's 
that one spot is such a thin, thin spot that it basically doesn't exist. So it's infinitely thin. If the bars are infinitely thin, then there isn't a probability of a specific value in these theoretical distributions. Now, in real data, there sure is. You could just count the number of people who said 10 to your survey, right? Or the number of people who were 10 years old in your group of kids or whatever it is. But in theoretical distributions, theoretically, this is perfectly continuous data. And any specific value occupies a space on the x-axis that's so thin that it's zero, that it's not no width at all. Therefore, we have to talk about ranges of values to tell us the probabilities of things. So we will say, you don't want to say what's the probability of um, a person having a 500 on the SAT, not if you're going to be using these particular kinds of distributions to help you solve problems. Instead, you would phrase it at a range. You would say, what's the probability of that a person randomly selected from the population would have um, a score between 500 and 600 or above 700 or above 500 or below 300 because those are ranges of possibilities. So why is this useful? Let's look at an example because I'm thinking of SATs. Assume that there's a distribution, assume that the distribution of SAT scores looks like this and it pretty much does. I was like, nice dinging sound. The mean, it's normal, that's what the n means, with a mean, population mean mu of 500, and a standard deviation, population sigma, of 100. That's SAT scores right there. Um, try and make them that way, they drift around, but let's assume that they're like that. Then what's the probability of selecting a score above the median? Well, it's a perfectly symmetrical distribution, so a normal distribution is symmetrical, so that probability is 0.5, 50% above Q3. You can find out where the third quartile is and you can just look at the area under the curve of the beautiful normal curve that starting from Q3 and going on up and you can figure out what that probability is. Above the 90th percentile you can figure out what that probability is too. Uh, so what is that probability? Mm, about five percent ish? I'm not thinking very clearly. Don't quote me on that but I could quote I could give it to you later. So how would you apply this? Well, let's say five friends are bragging about their SAT scores or you're having a casual college conversation and five of your friends in a row tell you they scored 650 or higher on the SAT. And, you know, some of them are in college, some of them aren't. But you think, what's the probability if these friends had been randomly selected that five scores would be above that value? Well, you can answer that question by saying, what's the probability of getting a mean of 650 from a sample of five individuals if they were randomly sampled. Now, they weren't randomly sampled. They're your friends, etc. But we can still get an idea of how implausible this seems. Now, maybe you're all honor students. Maybe you're all extremely smart. So it's possible. But if they were randomly selected, you know the T-critical? We'll talk about that later. Alpha. You can definitely look. Everything red under here is alpha. This is the distribution. This is the density function of the distribution of what we would expect all SAT scores to look like. In fact, it's not even SAT scores. This is the distribution of the means of any randomly selected group of five SAT scores. We're taking them five at a time. This is what the distribution of the means would look like. And finding a mean up here, a mean of 650 or above, is incredibly unlikely by chance. It's 0.02. Less than a 2% chance that any randomly grouped selected group of five students should have uh, a mean above 650, which means if everybody's saying 650 or above, then the mean was above 650, right? That's why I used this. Anyway, I don't know if you followed this or not, but this is how we use this kind of thinking and these theoretical distributions to compare, to stand in for real distributions, to answer questions about population means and other things when we are doing our hypothesis testing. Ta-da!